Okay. Hi, my name is Sasha Westerman Cuning, and I'm here today with Heriberto Hernandez, and we are both immigration attorneys here in South Florida and members of the Unauthorized Practice of Law Committee for the local chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. We're here today to bring you an important message about finding the right type of immigration help, because the wrong help can hurt. Uh, Edberto has generously um, offered to share a personal account of how much damage a non-lawyer or notario can do to your immigration case, but I think it's great if we start with the basics. So Edberto, why don't you tell us, what is a notario? Um, a notario is someone who um, is not authorized to practice law in the United States, and it is simply someone who's authorized to um, notarize documents or um, witness uh, signatures. Um, and Heriberto, why do you think here in South Florida there's so much confusion in the local community about notarios versus actual lawyers? It's a great question. Um, there is a, a huge misconception um, what a notario is. In many Latin American countries, South America, um, a notario is also an attorney who is also um, authorized to notarize documents as well as uh, provide legal advice. So there is a huge misconception and it's very misleading and unfortunately, people fall victim um, to that type of um, fraud and mistake. So in Latin America, all lawyers are normally also notarios. Yes. Uh, to my knowledge, yes. Um, a lot of uh, notarios are also lawyers and they can you know, provide legal advice as well as notarized documents. And let me ask you, Roberto, are you an actual notary? No, I am not. I'm also not a notary. So here in the United States, it's actually the opposite practice. Most lawyers are not notaries. Um, notaries go through just a three hour online class here in Florida to obtain their notary stamp. And like Roberto said, it is literally just someone who witnesses signatures on documents. Um, so how can someone then verify, Heriberto, if someone is a licensed attorney or not? Um, what I usually tell my clients is um, there are different ways to determine if the person you're dealing with is an attorney. Um, you can visit the um, local uh, bar website. Uh, for example, in the state of Florida, you can visit floridabar.org. Um, you can look at the attorney by name or license and you can determine whether or not the person is legible and in good standing to practice law in the state. So, for example, if you have uh, the name of your notario and you're trying to determine whether or not they're an actual attorney, you can visit the Florida Bar website and um, type in their name and you can see their results. Perfect. And um, what are some red flags that maybe a person would see that would lend them to believe that maybe this person is not actually a lawyer? Um, there are many red flags. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is... Uh, those businesses um, call themselves um, those themselves legal consultants mm -hmm. or immigration consultants. Um, they will tell you that you know sometimes they don't provide legal advice; that they're just simply a consultant helping you fill out forms. Um, those businesses also offer um, other services other than immigration. Um, some of them do tax. Um, paperwork, um, some of them fill out your food stamp application, um, they'll help you request um, Medicare, um, they provide other services other than immigration, so that's a huge red flag. And I think one of the red flags that I often see is um, when reviewing someone's paperwork after they've had a mistake and a problem, a denial in their case, I will look at the papers that were filed with immigration, I will often see that the preparer's section of the form is completely blank. And if you're signing forms that someone else has prepared on your behalf, and they have not filled out the section as a preparer, that is probably your number one red flag that this person is not an actually licensed attorney. I know both myself and Roberto, every time that we submit any paperwork to immigration, we sign every single form um, on behalf of our uh, clients certifying that the information provided to us is true and accurate to the best of our abilities. So the same way that every client um, applicant signs their form under penalty of perjury, us as the attorneys and the preparers also sign the applications under penalty of perjury. And when a non-lawyer is doing these services, they are a not allowed to sign that section of the form, and they also don't have to certify that the information in the form is true and correct, which is another um, leads to huge problems in the future 
because they are not under the same obligation as a lawyer to verify the accuracy of the information in the form. And um, so why is it so important then, Heriberto, that someone actually does work with a licensed attorney? Right. Um, leading to the issue with the forms, um, when a form is submitted to immigration um, petitioning for a specific form of relief, um, and then notario simply prepares the form, um, when you sign it, you're attesting that all the information on that form is true. Um, oftentimes, the information on those forms is incorrect or it was misrepresented. Uh, then the issue comes in when the form is reviewed by immigration and there's an issue with that form. Um, to the government, it would look as if you completed the form yourself right. and you didn't seek the help of a licensed attorney. Um, immigration is very complex. Um, an issue on a form, specifically notarios, tend to file asylums. Um, if the content of the asylum is misleading, it's incorrect, or it's false, that could result in your um, subsequent uh, deportation from the United States. And a permanent bar for any future immigration benefits. Right. Unfortunately, submitting a fraudulent or frivolous asylum claim um, will result in a permanent bar. Uh, perfect. And so um, one of the other reasons I think it's so important that people work with a licensed attorney is because we are regulated by our local bar association, the attorneys association, which gives out our licenses. And we have a whole series of rules and regulations that we have to follow to maintain our licenses. And some of that includes what we call continuing legal education, the fact that we have to stay up to date on all of the changes in the law. We have to follow the ethics rules. We cannot help people commit frauds. We have to verify information. Notarios and non-lawyers do not have to follow any of these rules. They don't have any licenses on the line. If Heriberto and I lose our license to practice because we are not doing something ethical, we no longer have ways to make money and support ourselves. So I always tell people, you know, I have people come and consult with me and they want me to do something fraudulent on their behalf. And I I always say the same thing to every person. I do not put my license on the line for anybody. And um, most lawyers, um, you know, will practice that same way. And when you have nothing to lose, you can go and file whatever you want with immigration. And notarios and non-lawyers really do not have much to lose. Um, they only can gain by taking your money and filing these applications. And they don't have to follow up or take the consequences of what happened as a result of that filing because they were not the preparer on the form. Um, unlike Heriberto and I, who if our cases are get denied, we will eventually receive a denial letter in our names. And I'm sure um, both of us take pride in our work. That is the last thing that we ever want for any of our clients. Notarios and non-lawyers generally don't care about the outcome of the case because they don't have anything on the line. So. I think this is a great time to segue into Heriberto's personal account of how him and his family were affected by this type of notario fraud. So my family, uh, my mom and I came from Colombia um, when I was about um, 12 years old. Um, we came to um, Florida and my mom started attending a church um, and this church was offering help for immigrants, specifically Colombians. Um, they were telling all the uh, Colombians that were attending that church that they would qualify for some type of asylum um, due to the fact that there was a lot of turmoil in Colombia with the government, narco traffickers, and guerrillas. So we, uh, my mom, you know, sought advantage of that opportunity that she thought was legit. Well, uh, this business was engaging in filing um, asylum applications. The asylum applications were... Uh, frivolous essentially uh, the content of the application was inaccurate um, they were fabricating evidence um, and they were coaching the immigrants what to say during the interviews um, my mom um, had an asylum interview this is probably a red flag that you're not yes. working with a lawyer if someone is coaching, coaching you um, or preparing saying that they can get a document for your asylum um, that is not something normally that a lawyer would actually do because it is rises to the level of fraud right um, so the uh, the asylum application was filed my mom attended an interview and the asylum was denied her case was referred to the immigration court 
Um, the church informed her that they would get an attorney to appear on her behalf. Well, that never happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the church was getting all the correspondence from the immigration court. Um, it, we had a court hearing that my mom and I failed to attend because we um, were not aware that um, we had a court hearing as the church was getting all the correspondence and was not forwarding it to the clients. And that's a great point that you're bringing up, Erdoberto. Myself, as a licensed attorney, I am under obligations by the Florida Bar to notify my clients of every single hearing and appearance that they need to make in front of the court or USCIS. In fact, I can get sued for malpractice if I do not notify my client of that date. Uh, when you work with a non-lawyer, that malpractice does not exist. This person is not authorized to practice in the first place, so they cannot commit malpractice. So if this person fails to advise you of a hearing, there's going to be no consequences for them. And the consequences, as Roberto yeah. is describing right now for the immigrant, are so huge. So working with a non-lawyer versus a lawyer can make a all the difference in how your case matter actually goes. Right. So after you got that deportation order, what happened? Yeah, so, so the main consequence was my mom and I were ordered removed from the United States. Um, of course, we didn't have any knowledge that we had been removed. Um, we continued living our lives. I continued going to school um, until one day immigration showed up at my mom's house. Um, I had recently moved out of my house, mm. fortunately, but my mom was taken into custody. Um, my mom was getting ready to leave for work, just like any other day, and ICE agents um, showed up in her driveway, blocked her car, and at gunpoint, essentially, she was ordered out of the car and taken into custody because they were enforcing an immigration judge's order. Um, gladly, at that time, my mom had retained the services of an attorney in Boca Raton, and um, he was able to reopen uh, my mom's case and my case. Um, during that time, before the case was reopened, my mom and I had to report every six months under an order of supervision to the ICE offices in Biscayne Boulevard. Um, gladly, um, our attorney was able to reopen the case, and my mom and I were able to obtain a green card and eventually um, became citizens of the, of the United States. So I think that Eduardo's story brings up a lot of important points. The first one I'd like to mention is that obviously your mom was going to this church and um, thought that they had the best intentions and they probably did have the best intentions in mind for her. And I think that that's really important to understand that sometimes even though someone may have the best intentions to help you, if they are not a licensed attorney, like we said in the beginning, that help can sometimes hurt. And so sometimes people think they're doing things, a family member, a church member, um, that they're going to help you you and um, for economic reasons you choose to go that route but as Roberto said and I'm sure um, financially the cost of fixing your case after all of these actions were taken um, were tremendous right. probably more than what you would have spent um, had it been done correctly from the beginning um, so it, it's just important to note that even though People, you know, may seem to have their best interest. You really have to still do your due diligence and see whether or not this person is actually qualified and capable to help you. Um, and the law is very clear that even advising what form to file is practice of law. Um, someone telling you you need to file this asylum application is a legal determination. Someone is analyzed or they're supposed to analyze are you qualified for asylum? Are you eligible for asylum? What are the problems in your asylum case prior to filing that application? I, I see it all the time that people that are, for example, a dual national, they have two citizenships and they are just black and white, not qualified for asylum, um, that a notario will submit an asylum application for them. What that means is that person is just on the fast track now to deportation because they had a dual national which made them ineligible for asylum in the first place. So it's just really important to always, always, always do your research and make sure you're working with someone who's qualified. So, Roberto, with, effort, uh, Roberto, with everything that you went through, um, was that one of the driving factors for you to become an immigration lawyer? Yes, absolutely. Um, after going through this um, difficult situation, not only the um, psychological effect and the toll that it took on me and my mom, I decided to go to law school, become an attorney, and practice immigration law. 
to be able to help others in similar situations, um, which I come across almost on a weekly yes. basis, um, but also to spread the knowledge and the community to um, not simply rely on notarios, to seek the counsel of an attorney. Um, sometimes notarios will charge you more than yes. an attorney would. Um, so, you know, my main goal is to help others in the community. Uh, and I am living proof that even if you were the victim of an notario, there's there may be a way out for you. Yes, Roberto went from being ordered deported to being a United States citizen now because him and his family eventually turned to the qualified help of a great immigration lawyer. So we just want to thank everyone for joining and listening. We hope that you'll spread this message throughout the community so we can help to stop the victimization of immigrants by notarios. And we want to let you know that even if you can't afford a private attorney like Herberto or myself, there are a lot of pro bono organizations or low income um, organizations that will help people who cannot afford a private attorney. The important part is that you just do your research and you try to find someone qualified to help you, especially under the current presidential administration. Even the smallest mistakes in your immigration form can not only lead to the denial of your case, but your potential deportation. So if you want to find someone qualified, you can always reach out to the Florida Bar or your local bar association or to the local chapter of your of American Immigration Lawyers Association. And there will always be someone there who can help guide you to finding a qualified representative. And in turn, Herberto also just wanted to mention that if you are the victim of a notario. Right. Um, do not be afraid to come forward and notify the authorities. Um, also, you can notify the Florida Bar. Uh, there is a committee that investigates um, unauthorized practice of law. Um, I always tell my clients, if you were the victim, you can contact the authorities because not only those notarios are committing fraud, they're also extorting thousands right. of dollars from people. Um, so do not be afraid. Um, I ask you to come forward and also do your due diligence. Make sure that you know you can find a qualified attorney in many, many ways. But don't be afraid to reach out. Thank you so much. And we wish you happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.